Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending where you are, um, where you're joining us from. So my name is Michelle Sandoval Rosario, and I am the Director of the Prevention Through Active Community Engagement Program for Region 9 within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. And what an honor to be here with all of you today. I first want to begin by thanking our partners at the National Hispanic Medical Society, both the national level and the Phoenix chapter, the Maricopa County Medical Society, the Maricopa County Public Health Department, and the Arizona Department of Health Services, who all have been key to putting this very important webinar together. So we know that in 2021 last year, the HIV epidemic marked its 40th year anniversary. We know that we have the tools to end this epidemic with effective medicines for prevention and treatment. But to get those tools to the people who need them, we have to be engaging with a broad range of providers to take on their role in ending the HIV epidemic. Healthcare providers play an essential role to ending the HIV epidemic, which is why I am so excited for the speakers we have today. who are going to be highlighting key roles providers have with scaling up HIV testing, prevention, and leakage to care. It's an honor to now introduce Dr. Ricardo Carrera, president of the Maricopa County Medical Society to begin our session. But I do want to recognize all women on this call for today is International Women's Day. So thank you all for everything you do and for attending. Enjoy. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sandoval Rosario for, for the introduction. And it's a real pleasure for us uh, uh, to be here uh, moderating this special session uh, a combination of multiple uh, organizations came together from the federal government to non-for-profit organizations to, to put this. And, and it's a real pleasure for me uh, uh, to, to be here and learning about this important topic for all of the community here in Phoenix, but also for everybody that is uh, uh, across the country. I want uh, to briefly introduce uh, my co-moderator, uh, Peta Fimbres, who, who is the Director of Marketing and Community Relationship for Palo Verde Pain Specialist, the CEO and President for Latina Strong, an organization that has this grassroots in the uh, uh, La Phoenix Latinx community. So uh, some housekeeping uh, before I introduce our amazing panelists that we have today is that please uh, free uh, mute yourself during the presentation. Uh, but if you have any question that can come during one of the presentations, just please put it in the chat box. Um, uh, but we would like to use uh, the questions and answer tab for any uh, uh, pertinent question that you want to use at the end of the webinar. We will have some time for uh, uh, asking your questions to all of the panelists. Uh, this webinar is recorded and it's been transmitted via Facebook Live. And the recorder, uh, uh, recording and slides will be available at nhmamd.org uh, after the event. So this is a very interactive session. We have amazing speakers I mentioned, and uh, I will first introduce uh, our first speaker, Dr. Um, Melanie Taylor, uh, that is an infectious and internal medicine physician. She's a captain at the US Public Health Service and a medical epidemiologist for the US CDC uh, during 2016 and 2020. She was assigned to the WHO in Geneva, Switzerland to lead a global effort to eliminate mother to child transmission of syphilis. She is a practicing HIV physician at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center. She has been a clinical associate professor with the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix in the Department of Family Medicine and Community and Preventive Medicine. She is currently assigned by the CDC Division of HIV Prevention to Arizona Department of Health, a Maricopa County Health Department, where she assists with STD and HIV treatment and prevention at the public STD clinic. Um, oh, very important before I set the floor to uh, my co-moderator, Petra, is that uh, this is also uh, uh, sponsored by uh, National Hispanic Medical Association in uh, National and the National Hispanic Medical Association of Phoenix Chapter and the Maricopa County Medical Society uh, that has been uh, great partners in this. So Petra, the floor is yours.
I'm having some difficulty. Go ahead, Dr. Pereira. Oh, so uh, the other um, speaker that we have today is Dr. Tanis Vanek, who is a, a chief medical officer for Spectrum Medical. He's currently overseeing medical care for over 1,600 HIV patients and over 700 PrEP patients. He was appointed to serve as, uh, on the City of Phoenix Fast Track Cities Initiative in 2016. He's a crucial leader for the Citywide Rapid Start Program, which was launched in September 2018 to immediately link newly diagnosed HIV patients to care. And then we have our uh, 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 other speaker. Uh, all of them are, are being, we thank you for, for all your participation and I agree on doing this webinar, Dr. Larry Jork, uh, who is a clinical infectious disease pharmacist who has been working with the Peterson HIV Clinic since 2016. He's part of the collaborative care team approach to a patient management in working with people living with HIV and well as an individual seeking HIV pre and post exposure prophylaxis. Additionally, Dr. York with, a, with an infectious disease physician uh, works with an infectious disease physician to deliver HIV and general infectious disease care to the Department of Correction via telemedicine. So as you can see, we have first line top of the top speakers today, and we are very thankful to them. So without any delay, I will set the floor to Dr. Melanie Taylor so she can start her presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that nice introduction and happy International Women's Day to all. I will go ahead and get started with this presentation and just to welcome everyone to this, this session on pre-exposure prophylaxis. What I'll be talking about today is expanding HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP services in Maricopa County. Next slide, please. I want to start first with a little bit of epidemiology and background on the HIV incidence in Maricopa County. What you can see is that we had high, the highest rate of recent years in 2018, and this has been followed by a couple of years of decline, with the low in 2020 possibly and likely reflecting the COVID epidemic, with, which may have influenced folks' access and ability to be tested. So what we think is the, those numbers for 2020, and thus those numbers that are soon to be available for 2021, may also be reflective of decreased access to HIV testing. Next slide, please. What we do know is that of oh, those who are diagnosed, those new cases, those incident cases that we, in Maricopa County, we've seen something happen that's troubling. And that is from the years 2015, 2020, we have seen an increase in the diagnosis of persons of Hispanic ethnicity in Maricopa County. And this is designated on the left side of the slide in the orange vertical bar. Now, previously, rates of HIV and HIV, new cases of HIV were high among African-Americans and Hispanics, but you can see that now Hispanics have surpassed African-Americans and are now the highest risk race ethnicity group for new diagnosis of HIV in Maricopa County. On the right side, you'll see that that risk group that reaches the highest number of persons diagnosed still is in the quite young age group of 20 to 24 and 25 to 29. Next slide. When you take a look at the incidence by risk, we still see that men who have sex with men represent the highest risk group. And that is followed by a group of folks for which we don't have an identified risk. And then the other risk groups are less. Um, and so what we think it's important to remember also is that high risk heterosexual sex is also one of the higher risk groups of those remaining. When you take a look at the incidence by gender, men still predominantly represent the majority of new cases of HIV in Maricopa County. Next slide. Today, we're gonna to be talking about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I wanna stop for just a quick second and ask what is PrEP? Let's define it. It is one method of reducing acquisition of HIV and it is to be used with other prevention practices. PrEP is specifically once daily oral dosing of a combination pill, those pills are either tenofovir disoproxil from fumarate plus intracytamine or tenofovir alafenamide plus intracytamine. The drug names for those are Truvada and Descovi. PrEP has received a US 
Public Health Service Task Force rating of A in June of 19. And the data suggests that when taking PrEP regularly, daily specifically, and consistently at least four times per week, the risk of acquiring HIV is reduced by about 99%. Something that's even more exciting is a new drug that's recently been approved for the use for PrEP is cabotegravir. And cabotegravir injections are now FDA approved for PrEP. And these are very less often injections which can prevent HIV. Below, I've put the HIV risk estimates and prevention strategies in the link for you to look at later on your own. Next slide. So the recommendation and the reason why we're here are twofold. One, the United States Public Health Service Task Force, as well as the US CDC, has released new recommendations for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And these recommendations call for the notice and education of all sexually active adult and adolescents, pos adolescent patients about pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. And these recommendations come alongside other recommendations to alert and educate providers to offer PrEP as a core primary care service for HIV prevention, to reduce missed opportunities for PrEP and missed opportunities for HIV prevention to increase the knowledge of PrEP among potential users, and also to garner a community-wide recognition and recommendation for PrEP in at-risk communities. And so that PrEP users can recommend PrEP to other folks who are at risk. Next slide. One of the other reasons we want to come to you this evening to talk about PrEP is that we have concerning increases among other sexually transmitted infections. And as you may know, sexually transmitted infections, such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, increase the risk of acquisition of HIV. So let's take a look at some of those. For gonorrhea, you can see that since 2018, and even through the COVID pandemic, we've had increasing rates fairly steep increases in the rates of gonorrhea in Maricopa County. Next slide. What's also concerning and even more concerning is the rate and trend of syphilis in Maricopa County. Now of all sexually transmitted infections, the diagnosis of syphilis is the most concerning in a patient regarding risk of HIV acquisition. Syphilis is a sentinel event that predicts HIV acquisition. So when you see a case of syphilis, remember that patient is likely to acquire HIV in the very near future, unless they are offered other prevention practices for which they are able to maintain. And now with the release and scale up of PrEP, our syphilis patients should be top on that list. Next slide. Let's take a look at what the rest of the country looks like regarding the syphilis rates. You can see that the West, including Arizona, has the highest rates of primary and secondary syphilis, the most infectious rates, the most, the, the rates for the stages of syphilis for which the highest association of HIV acquisition exists. Next slide. And Arizona overall is in a group of states here in the West, which have very high rates of primary and secondary syphilis. And they are accompanied by several of the states in the Southeast. Next slide. So what I want to talk to you now about is what it's like to prescribe PrEP. Talk about physician willingness, talk about what it's, what, how to pres pre prescribe PrEP, and also to talk about some of the similarities of what PrEP looks like compared to some of the other preventive drugs that we need. First, let's talk about physician willingness. What we know is that there are very high risk groups of, for example, HIV discordant couples. Providers are very willing to prescribe PrEP. And generally for all risk groups for which we know HIV acquisition is high, providers are generally very much willing to prescribe PrEP. And even for those populations that we don't encounter that often, but for whom we know PrEP is very highly indicated, such as those who are injecting drugs and those who are in methadone maintenance for prior drug use, there is a less, less willingness to prescribe PrEP, but still very high. But let's think of this in another way. What we have in the community now are very young populations. We have a high methamphetamine use in Maricopa County. Some of that methamphetamine use is injectable and it's associated with unsafe sexual behaviors. So although those are not on here necessarily, persons who have had a history of recent STI, our situation here in Maricopa 
is slightly different, but very much indicative of the risk of HIV incidence increase in the next few years. Next slide. So let's think about this. What I want to describe first is the fact that we are here to recruit you to be considered as a PrEP provider. But in the event that you don't feel comfortable after our presentations tonight and potentially becoming a PrEP provider, please know that your patients can be referred outside your practice to approximately our 16 known PrEP providers in the community. Now, PrEP Locator is a national website, and if you wish to become a PrEP provider, you simply log on to this PrEP site, www.preplocator.org, and enter your clinic or your, your health practice information. And the CDC will review your file and then they will add you to the list. So that way we can increase the number of PrEP providers in the community. As you've seen from the number of STI cases who are all eligible, of course, for PrEP as prevention, there are far too few PrEP providers in Maricopa County to offer this important preventive medication and effort to the number of people who need it. Next slide. So what we wanna talk about now is the fact that we have other ways of connecting folks to, to PrEP services. And one of these ways is through the information that is offered through the Arizona State Health Department, specifically through a federal funding opportunity, the HIV prevention program at the Arizona Department of Health Services is able to fund eight different agencies across three different regions to offer PrEP and PEP navigation services. So you may want to have a warm handoff of your patient to a specific appointment and accompanied by potential benefits coordination to ensure that the patient can access PrEP for free. And those services are available. The Area Agency on Agent Aging and care directions there, the number and information is available. And also a full, for a full directory, you can see those two additional websites, which are in English and Spanish. The navigators are specially trained to assist patients with booking appointments. And many of them are already very familiar with insurance plans, which require pre-authorization to be submitting submitted. So we have the, the services to connect patients to the PrEP services so that you're not simply just giving them the list of PrEP providers, but we can provide a warm handoff with an appointment and benefits coordination. Next slide. In addition to that, there are workshops and trainings on PrEP that are available specifically through the AIDS Education Training Centers at the national level, the, that in our Arizona AETC and the Pacific AETC or AIDS Education Training Center. Also, I want to talk to you about academic detailing. This is one-on-one, -on -one, peer to peer educational outreach. Next slide. In academic detailing, we have the opportunity to teach providers when one-on-one -on -one short sessions to or in a small group to provide continuing education with the goal of facilitating prescriber adoption of key messages as well as providing prep. This detailing gives providers the opportunity to receive very personalized and consistent evidence-based messaging on HIV prevention initiatives from a health department representative. And it also promotes relationship building to promote open communication between the health department personnel and providers. Next slide, please. Now let's go back. Let's go back and talk a little bit about what the lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis is by race, ethnicity, and sex. And please remember the rates of HIV among African Americans and among Hispanic persons in Maricopa County. Let's take a look here at this national numbers from CDC, looking at the lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis among African American men. You can see that of all African American men, one in 20 will be diagnosed with HIV. Among African American women, one in 48. The same for Hispanic men, one in 48. Now those rates are very high, but let's keep in mind our men who have sex with men or our population of men who are at the highest risk and take a look at the bottom numbers. One in two black men who have sex with men, their lifetime risk for HIV acquisition is one in two. And that is very similar to one in four for Hispanic men who have sex with men and one in 11 for white men who have sex with men. Next slide. 
So let's talk about some of the ways that we can draw some, uh, some similarities between some of the other preventive medications that we use, such as birth control, oral contraceptives, or let's use the example tonight of metformin. So metformin has very similar properties or let's say prevention counseling and follow-up as we use for Truvada or Descovy, tenofovir emtricitabine. So it's indicated let's say metformin is indicated as an adjunct, as, as is Truvada or PrEP, which is used in combination with safer sex practices. The diagnosis you're trying to prevent, of course, is diabetes with metformin, HIV, in this case of use of Truvada. And there is counseling associated with that related to, to improving fasting glucose. And in the case of HIV prevention, improving sexual behavior and increasing compliance with medication, which is, which is the Truvada. There's behavioral interventions regarding PrEP that's related to condom use, reducing the number of partners and knowing your HIV status of your partners. Whereas we offer the same or similar type of counseling for metformin related to weight loss and increased physical activity. The clinical assessments of follow-up for Truvada or PrEP or Descovy require us to look at renal function, to gauge for any toxicities, and to do frequent HIV screening at least every three months and STI screening at least every six months. In Maricopa County, I would recommend that HIV STI screening be done every three months. And adherence is important. Adherence is one of the things that we want to remember for both metformin as well as, as PrEP, but for PrEP specifically, we wanna see at least four or more doses per week that patients are taking. Next slide. So the point is, let's keep it simple. We want to inform all sexually active patients about the availability of pre-exposure prophylaxis. We want to take advantage of our electronic medical records to capture information that may identify them as being at risk. We want to take a team approach, pull in other members of your clinic so that there can be multiple opportunities for counseling and education of your patients as well as your providers. Next slide. And we also want to put some simple questions within the intake of every patient, and that is related to sexual risk. Now, this is with or without PrEP. Honestly, this is one of the things that we need to be doing for all of our patients so that we can understand their risk of HIV, but not just HIV, other sexually transmitted infections as well. And these questions can be, for example, are you sexually active? If yes, do you have sex with, with men, women, or both? It's really important to make this a fluid conversation, one that doesn't come with anxiety provoking feelings for either the provider or the patient, but you want to just flow through it as it is the same for each patient that you see. You can ask if they have a partner with HIV, recently had sex without a condom, bacterial sexually transmitted infections in the past month, and whether or not they have or recently used injection drugs. These are some of the examples of questions that you can use. Next slide. The least that you need to know for PrEP also gives you the information that you need to make a decision on whether to offer PrEP. And these are a bit small, unfortunately, for this, this presentation, and I apologize for the size, but we will make the slides available so that you can take a look at them. But you can see that if they have an HIV positive partner and they're in a discordant couple, you want to make sure that you consider their opportunities for PrEP if that patient had, doesn't have an undetectable viral load or if the partner doesn't have an undetectable viral load. Unsafe sex without using condoms, previous history of bacterial STIs in the recent past, and of course, injection drug use. Next slide. So now we have the opportunity to screen our patients, and it is a new recommendation that they're we really have a low threshold for using HIV viral load, HIV RNA, for testing patients who have star, who are starting or restarting PrEP. And that is because we want to avoid the misdiagnosis of HIV in what might be a window or an ellipse period. And that is also the case for patients who are restarting or continuing PrEP who have had recent antiretroviral use on PrEP previously. And that means that the, it is moving towards the screening test uh, use of an HIV viral load, whereas before we were able to use antibody tests. Next slide. So with that in mind, we do offer free HIV test kits. Now, HIV test kits are not viral load test kits, but they can be a first stop 
for testing patients. And if negative, they can be very helpful. But those are available for free for anyone who needs those. They can are available from the Arizona Department of Health Services. And I have listed our contact, Deborah Reardon, on this slide. Next slide. So as I get towards the end, I want to ask the question of you, and I want you to please think about it, because we have many populations at risk and we have many opportunities to prevent HIV. The question is, is it worth it? In clinical medicine, we frequently use the term number needed to treat, and the number needed to treat is the number of persons you need to treat in order to prevent one case of the, the medical diagnosis that you're trying to prevent. And what you can see in this comparison on the left is that the number of persons that you need to treat with a statin drug in order to prevent one MI is 60 people. Similarly, the number of people you need to treat with an ACE inhibitor to prevent death is 56. But take a look at the number needed to treat in purple for an MSM to prevent one case of HIV. It's only 37. And take a look at the number that you need to treat for using PrEP to prevent HIV in black MSM, that's in yellow. And that is only 11 persons to prevent one HIV. And for women that are in an HIV discordant couple, it's only 15. Now there are many op missed opportunities. We see that in the New York City, folks who've had a prior negative test were not offered PrEP, even though they later seroconverted. So they had that opportunity to receive PrEP, but they didn't. And then they were diagnosed with HIV in South Carolina, um, similar missed opportunities. Also with the Veterans Administration, you can see that there are delays in receiving PrEP and in Alabama adolescents at a primary care center. Only less than half had a PrEP or 44% had a PrEP indication, but none were offered prescribed PrEP. Next slide, please. So what I want you to ask yourself is, can you think of reasons why you shouldn't offer PrEP? And if you don't come up with many, consider placing yourself on this PrEP locator list. And if you find that you're not quite ready, please consider the academic detailing that we offer through the State Health Department here in Arizona, and also consider the opportunity to refer your patients out to our PrEP providers in Maricopa County, because they are waiting to increase the number of persons that have that opportunity to prevent the prevent HIV transmission for themselves. So that's all I have. I would like to thank our, our organizers and I would like to thank my colleagues at Arizona Department of Health Services and also Dr. Dawn Smith from CDC for sharing her slides. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor for this amazing presentation. Now I would like to introduce you to Dr. Vanig. Good evening, everyone. So in this uh, next session, I'm going to talk about how PrEP can pay, play a major role in ending the HIV epidemic in our community. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the two major plans to end HIV. The one on the left is the UNAIDS Fast Track Cities Initiative, which I'm going to talk about later. On the right is the EHE, or Ending the HIV Epidemic. This is a national plan that was launched in 2019 with a goal to reduce the newly diagnosed HIV by 75% by the year 2025 and by 90% by the year 2030. There are four pillars in the EHE plan, and you can see that one of them is prevention, which is PrEP. Uh, next slide, please. So you know, in order to really end the HIV epidemic, we have to approach this with what, with what we call the HIV status neutral. So when you offer the HIV testing to the patient, regardless of the outcome, we always offer patients something. So we have two uh, uh, tools in our toolbox right now. On the left, we have a prevention of PrEP. And on the right, we have treatment as prevention. So let's focus on the right. Uh, we call uh, treatment as prevention because if you have HIV positive individual, you can offer them uh, rapid HIV uh, treatment. And we know that when patients on uh, ART, their viral load will become undetectable. And in patients with, uh, with, with an undetectable viral load, they cannot transmit the virus through sexual contact. We call that U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. So the sooner we get a HIV positive patient on the treatment, the sooner we can re reduce the transmission risk. 
Now on the left, if the patient is tested negative, we should offer them a PrEP according to their uh, HIV risk. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows the uh, HIV burden in uh, Arizona. You've seen this uh, on Dr. Taylor's slide. Uh, next slide, please. You can see that, uh, in, can you go back, please? <laughs> In 2020, Hispanics account for about 32% of the Arizona's population. However, Hispanic uh, account for about 40% of all newly diagnosed HIV. Uh, next slide, please. And among those uh, Hispanic, you can see that about 72% were born in the, in the US, 20% were born in Mexico, and 8% were born uh, in someplace else. Uh, next slide, please. Next, uh, we're going to talk about how STI should prompt you to uh, ask an, uh, the patient about uh, HIV risk. Uh, next slide, please. And this all started with uh, taking a, a good sexual history that Dr. Taylor has mentioned. Uh, I want to show you some numbers right here. So if you have a person that presented with uh, STI with genital ulcers, for example, syphilis, they are at five times higher risk of acquiring HIV. If you look at men with syphilis, about 20% of them will become HIV positive within the next 10 years. In MSM patients with two prior uh, rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia, they are at eight times higher to become HIV positive. And if, if you look at men with history of rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia, one in 15% a person will become HIV positive in the next one year. So if you see a patient coming in asking for an HIV testing, STI testing, or any patients that present with STI, that should prompt you to talk about HIV risk and offer them a PrEP. Next slide, please. So I wanna show you the uh, rate of chlamydia in, uh, in, in, in our this is the rate from, from, for the whole country. So you can see that Maricopa County ranked number three in terms of uh, chlamydia in the country. Next slide, please. And you can see that Blacks, uh, Native Americans and Hispanics are more uh, affected by uh, chlamydia than whites. Next slide, please. You can see that Hispanic uh, female has a higher rate of uh, chlamydia than Hispanic male. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of gonorrhea, you can see the same thing. Uh, Maricopa, Maricopa County ranked number three in terms of a gonorrhea rate in the, in the country. Next slide, please. And same thing, uh, Blacks, uh, uh, Native American and Hispanics are more affected than whites. Next slide, please. You can see that uh, Hispanic male has a higher rate of uh, gonorrhea than Hispanic female. Next slide, please. And same thing with a primary and secondary syphilis. You can see that Maricopa County, again, ranked number three uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, next slide, please. You can see that uh, the majority of, of, of uh, primary and secondary syphilis in the country uh, affects MSM. Next slide, please. And again, Blacks, Latinos, and um, are more affected than whites. Next slide, please. And again, uh, male uh, Hispanics has a higher rate of uh, primary and secondary syphilis than female Hispanic. Next slide, please. So this is the STI uh, uh, incidence of um, STI in Maricopa County in, in 2021. You can see that if you look at any STI, chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis, Hispanic uh, are up on the top. So this is something that is alarming. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, this slide shows you the uh, relative contribution in decline of the HIV in incidence in the US from 2012 to, to uh, 2017. And you can see that um, PrEP actually is more effective than, than uh, treatment as prevention in reducing the number of new cases of HIV. So next slide, please. 
So it is estimated that, that uh, about 1.2 million Americans are likely to benefit from PrEP. These are people with PrEP indications. However, if you look at the real number, only 18% are on PrEP and 82% without PrEP. Next slide, please. And there are a, a big disparities among uh, PrEP users in the US. You can see that um, the, among white, 60%, 66% of uh, white with PrEP indications are, are already on PrEP and that surpassed the 50% goal, which is our goal for the EHE. However, among black it's only 9% and among Hispanic it's only 16%. So we still have a lot more to do in the Hispanic community to get the number up to 50%. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at the number of PrEP that PrEP users that we need in Arizona, the total will come out to about 25,000. And this is something that is enormous. There's no way we can achieve that number without the help of primary care provider. You can see that among that uh, Hispanic MSM account for about 7,000 PrEP users. Now, if you look at the number on the right, I'm gonna explain this a little bit. It's a, what we, we call this a PrEP to need ratio or PNR. A PrEP to need ratio is a ratio of PrEP users to the number of newly diagnoses of HIV. And if you look at the PNR of other successful cities in the US, for example, San Francisco, Seattle, and New York City, that can, they can really reduce the rate of new infection. The PNR number is about one to 20. Now, if you look at the number in Maricopa County right now, our PNR is at one to 5.7. So next, please. You can see that in Maricopa County, we need to increase PrEP user by fivefold, and we cannot achieve this without your help. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Fast Track Cities Initiative. Um, next slide, please. So the Fast Track Cities Initiative is the UNAIDS program with a goal to end HIV in big cities by the year 2020, no, 2030. Uh, there are over 350 cities around the world. And in the US, we have uh, 27 cities that uh, participate. Next slide, please. So the city of Phoenix joined Fast Track Cities in uh, 2016. Uh, next slide, please. So our goal is to reach the UN AIDS uh, 90, 90, 90, zero. The first 90 is that we want 90% uh, of people living with HIV to know their status. And then we want those people, about 90% of them to uh, get on uh, antiretroviral therapy. And we would like at the end, 90% uh, of people on, on antiretroviral therapy achieving undetectable viral load, since we know that undetectable equals untransmittable. The last number zero is the zero stigma. We know that we cannot achieve a 90, 90, 90 goal without getting rid of the HIV stigma. So next slide, please. So the city of Phoenix launched a rapid start program to link newly diagnosed HIV patients to care within uh, the same day or maximum five days. This uh, citywide program was launched in September of 2018. Uh, next slide, please. We will uh, connect patients to our uh, rapid start navigator who can apply, uh, navigate all the health insurance. For people who are, who are uh, uninsured, we can enroll them in the uh, Ryan White and ADAP program within the same day, no later than four hours. And uh, we can link patients to care within the same day. And currently we have uh, seven rapid start clinics in Maricopa County. Next slide, please. So I wanna show you some progress that we make so far in Maricopa County. So next slide. So this is the HIV care continuum in 2015. We start at 85, 51, 50% viral suppression at the end. And next slide. And this is the data from uh, 2019. We came up to uh, 86, 60 and 65%, meaning that 65% of um, People are undetectable. Next slide, slide, please. 
And this is the result of our uh, rapid start program. This look at the days from diagnosis to linkage to care. Uh, we can reduce the time from linkage to care in Maricopa from 30 days in 2018 to six days as of uh, 2020. Next slide, please. This in turn means that we can get patients to undetectable, which they cannot transmit the virus. And um, right now we are at 37 days as of 2020. Next slide, please. So uh, another program that uh, we would like to expand in Maricopa County is to, is, to, is to expand PrEP program. And this is where we need your help. We would like uh, to, uh, all the primary care provider in the county to offer HIV testing and offer PrEP to uh, patients who are at high risk of uh, getting HIV. Uh, next slide, please. So how can you help us end the HIV in our community? Next slide, please. Very easy. So two things that you have to do. One is to offer HIV testing, and the second one is to offer PrEP. And as Dr. Taylor said, um, both uh, HIV testing and PrEP are the grade A recommendation by the USPS task force. For HIV testing, it should be offered to all pregnant persons and all adolescents and, and adults aged 15 to 65. And for PrEP, it should be offered to all persons at high risk of HIV uh, acquisition. Next slide, please. So the city of Phoenix has created this HIV poster with uh, some uh, important information that you can use. On the left, if you have a newly diagnosed HIV patients, you, you can call a rapid start hotline there and we can link the patients to care and uh, get on ART within the same day. On the left, this is the number that you can call. However, I, I, I encourage you to uh, start offering PrEP in your practice. However, if you feel uncomfortable, you can call the that uh, PrEP and PEP hotline. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. What I'm gonna do is uh, you can uh, request the HIV poster from the city of Phoenix. I'm gonna drop my uh, email into the chat box. And also uh, Chris Garcia from ADHS will uh, drop a link that you can link uh, HIV positive patients to uh, HIV services for both medical and non-medical uh, to ensure that patients are in care. So thank you very much. That's all I have, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Vinick. Uh, was very enlightened, um, all the things that you mentioned. Uh, now I want to introduce uh, Dr. York. All right, thanks everyone for having me. So a little bit of an unusual topic, I think for general providers out there, but focusing on PEP to PrEP. So post-exposure prophylaxis, transitioning to pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I'm just gonna do a quick overview of PEP, kind of the nitty gritty, how it is done. And then how we use that as a strategy for transitioning a lot of folks eventually to PrEP. Next slide, please. All right, so the main focus I wanna put on this is a little bit of background on PEP, but if you're not aware, as of last year, major overhaul to the, the CDC STI guidelines. So gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas in particular have rather different recommendations, and we tend to see this a lot not only in PEP if we're empirically treating, but in PrEP as we are routinely trying to follow these folks for STI acquisition and treating them adequately. And then lastly, I'll talk about some of our strategies that we use down here in the Peterson Clinic for using PEP as kind of a springboard for getting folks started on PrEP. Next slide, please. All right, go ahead and skip to the next one. All right, so post-exposure prophylaxis, if you aren't familiar with, We've already had some lovely discussions on PrEP. Essentially, post-exposure prophylaxis is taking one of those PrEP medications, namely Truvada, which is emtricitabine and tenofovir disoproxyl, and adding one more agent to that combination. So essentially, PEP is a fully active regimen against HIV. And that's really kind of the method of operation for PEP. 
you're trying to treat the HIV that someone potentially has been exposed to. So typically we've got two pills. This is done for four weeks, so 28 days total to ensure the highest or best outcomes possible after that period. So PEP, absolutely you can think of this as the plan B equivalent of HIV. Upon exposure, you start that clock. You now have 72 hours to get someone started on PEP and increase the chances that they don't get a lifelong infection from HIV. And a lot like plan B, even though you've got the 72 hour window, always the sooner the better. The outcomes really in a lot of these, these studies were like within two to four hours. So absolutely speed is critical, critical here. Next slide, please. Okay, so thankfully PEP is relatively straightforward. The vast majority of folks you see are all gonna be on the same, what we call backbone, namely again, Truvada or its generic equivalent. And that's emtricitabine and tenofovir disoproxyl. At this point, there really isn't a hard recommendation in using Discovy for PEP. There's a little bit of data looking at it in combination with some other drugs, but as of right now, nothing yet. So strictly Truvada. Now the second component that's usually added is either dolutegravir, the brand name, which is Tivike, or raltegravir, which is Icentris. Now, both of these medications, or all three of these that are discussed here, they're typically very well tolerated. I completely agree with, with what Dr. Taylor posted. The absolute best analogy for HIV medications as a whole is a lot like metformin. If folks are gonna have issues, what I typically uh, describe in my counseling, is it's usually that first couple of weeks you tend to see some GI side effects. And as long as you stick it out and they're tolerable, that tends to go away. So that tends to be the number one thing that I tell folks. Second, this combination, whether it be with uh, Tivike, Dalutegravir, or Icentris, Raltegravir, is a particularly potent combination in established HIV infection. So Truvada plus Dalutegravir is still a first-line regimen for folks newly diagnosed with HIV. So you cover a lot of those bases when you use that, that regimen for PEP. Now, of course, as with HIV, I think most people are familiar with, it is highly effective if taken as prescribed. So adherence is critical for HIV medication as it is for PEP medication. And of course, this is an easy combo to administer. One of the advantages, getting ahead of myself here though, is if you use dolutegravir, this is simply a, a two tablet regimen that you take once a day. Whereas raltegravir, slightly less convenient, but it's a regimen that is twice a day in that case. All right, next slide. All right, so looking at dolutegravir, and I know in the chat or the questions, we have something about PrEP, so I think we'll talk about some of those in just a bit. But focusing on dolutegravir, so the advantages of this medication, much like Truvada, much like raltegravir, it's very well tolerated. It tends to be very easy to take. Dolutegravir's advantage, again, over raltegravir is that it is once daily dosing. The big thing that I really like about dolutegravir, this tends to have a very high barrier to HIV resistance. Now, admittedly, resistance to either dolutegravir or raltegravir is fairly rare. It is quite an uncommon thing. It's not even routinely tested for as of yet. But dolutegravir tends to be at the top of the heap in terms of resistance to HIV. Now, one of the disadvantages, and this is still something that I see coming up often, is this risk of neural tube defects. So if we have an individual who is taking dolutegravir when she becomes pregnant, there was at one point some concern that that could increase the risk of neural tube defects. I will circle back to this in just a second, but do keep that in mind as we do talk about that. So next slide. So raltegravir, it does have some data for use in pregnancy, not a whole heck of a lot, but it does have some. The disadvantages again, it is twice daily dosing, and it does tend to have a lower barrier to HIV resistance. Now, I had just mentioned resistance to either of these two medications is, is quite rare. If you were going to see it, it would be to raltegravir. That does tend to be 
the lower end of the spectrum when we talk about this particular class of medication. Other issues that we tend to run into getting it through insurance for, or not insurance, for the manufacturer, if someone is uninsured, tends to be much more difficult with this medication versus dolutegravir. So one other potential uh, advantage is acquisitions of the medication. Next slide. All right, so circling back to that neural tube defect issue, this came out a few years ago. So there was a study in Botswana and they were studying exactly what I had mentioned, where if a female is on dolutegravir at the time of conception, it seemed that there could be a chance that then the little one had a higher rate of neural tube defects. Now, already there were some concerns with this study. This was an early analysis. It was not complete at the time that this came out. And Botswana has higher rates of neural tube defects to begin with. This wasn't really something that we had seen in this country through what data that we did have available. And eventually, once that study concluded, while there did seem to be a trend Officially, there was no statistically significant increase in neural tube defects. So if we do have any providers that are on the call tonight, either emergency room, urgent care, where you might deal with this, I really would, would recommend based on this data, I think dolutegravir tends to be an easier medication for a lot of folks to take, both in that it's once daily dosing, it does have that higher barrier to resistance. So it is something I would say we haven't totally dismissed. We still saw that trend, but essentially this was not the real issue that came out in that early data, but we still have some folks that do have that concern, especially if you have a woman of childbearing age that is seeking PEP in this circumstance. So the next slide. All right, so drug interactions that you have to worry about. I'm skipping a bit here with Truvada because quite honestly with Truvada, there's almost no significant drug interactions there you worry about. Discovy, not quite the case. There may be some medications to worry about, but certainly with dolutegravir and ralutegravir, there's a couple that you do have to be aware of. The big one that I ask most patients about, you do have to specifically ask, are you taking any supplements? So it's not necessarily the multivitamin that someone's taking, it's the polyvalent cations that are in that supplement that get thrown in. Calcium, magnesium, iron, aluminum, zinc, that tends to be the big one that comes up. So just counsel patients to separate. It is not a major interaction. It tended to be a bit worse if you were combining it with an antacid component for say Maalox. But as long as you space it out, you're A-OK. -okay. One of the issues that we have encountered with PEP are individuals seeking PEP, but they're on select anticonvulsants. And that is somewhat misleading is quite honestly, it's not that they're taking it for epilepsy. I see a fair number of individuals seeking PEP who are taking carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine for mood disorders. So again, psychiatric uh, backgrounds do tend to preclude higher risk of sexual violence later on. You could have a lot of individuals presenting with that and they are on these medications. So do be aware, this is one of the rare instances where you might run into some trouble with PEP. You do have to make sure in this circumstance that you're either adjusting dolutegravir appropriately, which easier said than done through insurance when, when seeking PEP, or using raltegravir, which has a little bit more data, some, some different issues here. The one other one that gets overlooked is dolutegravir and metformin. So I just used my own example, and this is biting me in the backside here. So dolutegravir, metformin, again, not a contraindication, but if paired together, you cannot do more than one gram of metformin a day. So in most folks, we may just cut that dose in half for the duration of PEP. All right, next slide for me, please. So this is absolutely the meat and potatoes when it comes to post-exposure prophylaxis. This comes from the CDC's guideline. I've got the link for you there. So if ever that you have to do PEP for a patient, these are the baseline things that we look for. I'll address some of them in a second, but I think more likely you're gonna be on the receiving end of the four to six week visit after that exposure. And no fault of the emergency room. It's a hectic environment. 
a lot of these things either don't get done, they're partially done, or there may be some things that are worth following up on that may not have gotten addressed at that initial visit. So big things to look out for here, and this is also relevant for PrEP, is hepatitis B serology testing. And it is recommending getting the full gamut of surface antibody, surface antigen, as well as the core antibody, specifically the IgG or the total. We're not really looking for an acute HPV infection just yet. So the reason for this, it does get overlooked, but Truvada and Descovy both do double duty covering for chronic hepatitis B. So it's less likely you'll run into an issue starting PrEP or PEP. It's more likely when the time comes to stop it, you may induce a flare if that individual did have underlying HPV that was missed. So that is one thing to keep in consideration there. And of course, this serves as an opportunity, especially if you're taking over PrEP care, is at this point, you can also vaccinate if an individual is needing hepatitis B coverage. Hep C, we're doing it baseline. Now, there's plenty of footnotes, and I've got them all in the next two slides that we'll just skip right through. But gonorrhea and chlamydia, some recommendations are to empirically treat, depending on the exposure, or World Health Organization recommends, probably for most folks, it's worth considering empirically treating them for these possible infections. If you do that, there's not really much sense in looking for it. You've already treated it. Pregnancy testing is done at baseline and of course, four to six weeks after exposure. The big one that I'm gonna focus on is that four to six weeks after exposure. If you are taking over care of this patient or they're transitioning to PrEP, you wanna make sure you repeat the HIV testing. So it has been mentioned before, there was recently a change in the recommendations for HIV testing. We now are seeing viral loads done more frequently. That hasn't quite made it into the PEP guidelines yet, which are a little bit outdated, but that is a consideration. We're trying to make sure that folks after that course of PEP continue to remain HIV negative and then can safely transition to PrEP. All right, next slide. All right, skip through the next couple here. This is just for y'all to read later. All right, yep, next one. Okay, so here's the big one. Next slide for me. All right, so I'm gonna skip through pretty quick. We're short on time. A lot of big changes here. So gonorrhea, typically we would do ceftriaxone 250 and azithromycin, no longer. Azithromycin has been completely dropped to be co-administered with ceftriaxone. Not really much benefit. We're probably just exposing folks to drugs that aren't really doing much for them. To compensate, the ceftriaxone dose has increased. So do be aware there is now a weight-based cutoff. Most folks will likely get 500 milligrams instead of 250. The other thing I wanna draw attention to is especially with oral pharyngeal gonorrhea. In the world of gonorrhea and chlamydia, that is probably the one major time it is now recommended to do a test of cure. So at least two weeks after treatment, it is worth redoing that swab as clearance rates are lower, particularly with this kind of infection. Next slide. Chlamydia, azithromycin still remains an option, but it's really for folks that you're unsure if they can follow up or if they're pregnant. The data now suggests that doxycycline for seven days is superior to azithromycin, certainly for rectal infections. So the recommendation now, unfortunately, more pills for that individual, but higher rate of clearance, particularly in rectal uh, infections. Next slide. Trichomonas, kind of the oddball guidelines don't really say a whole lot about it, and it's not super clear what the ideal scheme is for looking for it. But certainly for females, this can prove to be a difficult infection. This has now changed from metronidazole, that two gram one-time dose, to 500 twice a day, seven days, so somewhat mirroring now the switch to doxycycline. A lot of medications that these folks might be on for PEP. All right, next slide. All right, so PEP to PrEP, and then we'll finish this off after this next one. Next one for me. All right, so this has already been touched on. It's just that window period where potentially infections could be missed because we just don't have enough stuff to look for it. The fourth generation screening tests are fantastic. 
they can start detecting after about 14 days, although the median time is a bit later, somewhere around 18 days. The PCR, even faster. So this may even change in the future for PEP. All right, next slide. All right, how we do this then transitioning from PEP to PrEP, our clinic has truthfully uh, gained a lot of PrEP patients from seeing them initially for PEP. So a lot of folks may have multiple sexual partners, maybe a condom breaks, there's an incident that worries somebody, they go to Google, they look up PEP. These individuals upon completing PEP can essentially be transitioned right on into PrEP without missing a beat. So one of the counseling points, I don't think it's come up tonight for PrEP, and this is the data comes more from Truvada, is for anal receptive encounters, it takes seven days to reach maximum protective levels. For everything else, insertive encounters, vaginal injection drug use, it is a loose date of about 20 days. So the idea here is that by doing PEP, you have already conquered that 20 days and they're essentially covered for PrEP. So assuming that you get that HIV test first that confirms that they are still negative after PEP, you can just prescribe PrEP and slide right on into it. All right, next one. All right, so in conclusion, I know a bit unusual to talk about PEP. I think most folks present may not actively be participating in the baseline care of it, but certainly taking over for the follow-up care. And it is an opportunity for many folks to broach PrEP. Some folks may not have the advantage of having local clinics that can manage PEP. They may just have that initial ED visit and then essentially follow up with you know, a family medicine provider. So I think having some familiarity with it can be helpful to know what the patient may have been going through or in the rare event that you do get this consult, what you can advise the patient to do. And then lastly, STI management, a lot of big changes, still a little bit slow uptake I'm seeing in, in at least the community that I work in. So do be aware, there are some new recommendations there, okay? Right, and I think that's about it. Next slide, perfect. Dr. York, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. No worries. Now we're going to go into uh, questions. If anybody has any questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom right. And I did goof to Salvador. I was trying to write the answer to your first question. Apritude is the name of the injectable for PrEP. Cabotegravir is the generic. And it's it's a dose on day one, a dose one month later, but then it's actually every two months that you get that injection. All right. Um, I, I have one question. Um, there was uh, some data uh, that presented Dr. Taylor about uh, uh, and Dr. Vanek about the highest uh, uh, percentage one of sexually transmitted disease in Maricopa County and also of HIV infections. There is uh, any um, hypothesis of why Maricopa County has so high. There is a, a lot of uh, uh, difference in social determinant of health in health disparities that happen in Maricopa County. This can be a account of why they're so high in, in this area. Perhaps I can start first and please tennis, join me. Uh, we do interviews of patients who are diagnosed with syphilis in Maricopa County in order to find their partners and bring their partners in for treatment. And so we collect risk information from our sexually transmitted disease patients if they come to the STD clinic and specifically all of the syphilis patients and most oftentimes primary and secondary syphilis patients are interviewed either in their home, on the phone, or in the clinic when they come for its treatment. And what we find is there, there is a high co-association with drug use, methamphetamines, fentanyl, and other rise, and that there are multiple sexual partners, and that there are more women that are involved and have higher increasing rates of STIs among women. So when you have high increasing rates of STIs among women, that means you have also coincident increases in rates of STIs among heterosexual men, not just MSM. 
And so there is an, a disturbing trend that we've seen over the past three to five years of increases of STIs among women. We didn't talk about that much tonight because this is really a focus on PrEP, but there are increases among women, which we see in congenital syphilis rates. And Maricopa County, specifically Arizona, has the second highest congenital syphilis rates in the country. This is very, this is a tragic because, you know, syphilis causes stillbirth, low birth weight, neonatal death, and congenital deformities. And so we see very high rates. We also have outbreaks of, S of syphilis and other STIs in different parts of the state among American, Indian American Indians. And we see that other aspects of access to healthcare and risks associated with not having um, good health insurance or being a recent immigrant also are are risk factors that we see associated with syphilis. Now we don't have the data that is as good for the other STIs like chlamydia and gonorrhea, but those, those often track similarly to syphilis. I will say that syphilis has increased the fastest and the highest amount over the last five years as compared to the other STIs. So it is of great concern related to the risk of HIV transmission and for, specifically for the risk of congenital syphilis among infants born to women with syphilis. I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Um, there is uh, uh, another question that I have for Dr. York and, and there is one question in the in, in the chat uh, for Petra can ask. So, so Dr. York, there is a, um, you mentioned metformin as, uh, as one of the, uh, medication that we have to be aware. Of. And I, I, I am an endocrinologist, so I see a lot of patients that suffer diabetes and then now on top they are on HIV medication. Any of the other uh, antihyperglycemic drugs, new ones, um, specifically the GLP-1 agonists or SCLT2 inhibitors that uh, SCLT2 inhibitors mechanism is through the kidney. Uh, so we, should, should we are we aware of, of any interaction with those drugs? None that come to mind off the top of my head that I think about it. Let me, let me sit here and think about it a bit, but really metformin, I think, is the biggest one just because it is so prevalent. And it's very odd that this one random drug has this interaction. Certainly in HIV, anything that is a boosted agent, so anything with ritonavir or cobicystat, any kind of protease inhibitor, I double check all of those just to be on the safe side as they have a number of drug-drug interactions. But off the top of my head, none that are coming to mind. But I'm going to double check myself for you. Thank you so much. And, and you mentioned something very important: is that we see a Cushing patient, so Cushing exogenous Cushing in, in patients that use ritonavir, and then they have COPD, and then they're using an oh, yeah. inhaler. So, so yeah. that's a, that's that's very common, and, and we teach that very common that if a patient is a HIV medication that contains ritonavir, you have to be very careful when you use steroids inhalers because they can develop Cushing. Absolutely. That is uh, the other thing that's the most overlooked is that interaction that drives me nuts too. So I'm glad you all are doing that. That's awesome. Thank you. I, um, I do have one question that was in the chat. Um, it says my patient was uh, due to star Truvada, but checking his renal functions revealed LFTs in the 400s. It happened that he got COVID. Should I wait to start his Truvada? Anyone? Oh, Dr. Van, I got that one. It looks like. Yeah, so Truvada is, it is indicated to be used if the GFR is above 60. So as long as the GFR is above 60, it's okay to use Truvada. Thank the first you. thing that comes to mind is you have COVID and you're looking to be sexually active. I would wonder what's going on there for sure. But certainly hepatic monitoring is actually not recommended anymore for PrEP at all. Great. So I know that uh, it's uh, been an amazing hour and we can talk about this more and more time, but uh, it is time to, to close. So um, uh, we want to let everybody know that our upcoming events is our NHMA annual meeting that will be in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, in March 24 to 27th. And we have a COVID-19 virtual 
briefing session uh, on April 27. Uh, both the links are here uh, and they will appear in, in, in the chat box. So thank you so much. Also, uh, there is a primary care uh, activity for Maricopa County Medical Society on, the, uh, on March 19. Uh, and uh, I will ask, uh, uh, I, I will send the link um, uh, for everybody to, to, to join. So thank you, really appreciated your time, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Vanek, Dr. York, because uh, the experience learning here has been amazing. Thank you, Petra, for being an amazing co-moderator. And thank you, Dr. Sandoval, for uh, sponsoring this, for everything that you have done for preparing this. Uh, and thank you to NHMA National, uh, uh, for, for all the work that they have been doing on the back of this. So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time and see you soon or see you in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Bye.